Hello there, and welcome to the first episode of Let's Talk About Wargaming, a show where we talk about wargaming. Uh, my name is Jack Trumbull. I majored in uh, international relations at George Mason University, and I am a regular contributor on a few gaming websites such as wargamer.com and strategygamer.com. And I am here today with uh, Joe Fonseca. Hiya, I'm Joe Fonseca. I'm currently a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary, and I too am a regular contributor at websites like Wargamer and a couple others here and there. And today, uh, we are going to be talking about the Second Sino-Japanese War, a topic that isn't really talked about or discussed or covered by uh, war games very much. Joe here is the expert between the two of us on the Sino-Japanese War, so uh, without further ado, Joe, if you want to take it away. Yeah, I thought it would be important to talk about the Second Sino-Japanese War as a a space for wargaming, or really a lack of, because it is such an important part of the Second World War, especially if you look at it from a more global point of view. So, very, very brief cliff notes. 31, the Empire of Japan invades northeastern China and establishes a puppet state called Manchukuo. Uh, there's inconclusive skirmishing and political back and forth and failing diplomacy all across the uh, Japan's dealings with other states. And then 37, you see a escalation to an actual full-scale war with Japanese forces attacking um, Shanghai and attacking down towards Beijing and Chinese forces being forced to fight back. And this becomes a huge, grueling, awful campaign. Pretty much all the worst parts of modern warfare are on display across China from 37 to 45. And complicating that is the internal um, instability that's racking China. So you have nominally in control of the country, the nationalists led by Chiang Kai-shek, but there are also innumerable uh, warlords, regional powers, and of course Mao Zedong and the communists who are also uh, vying for control amongst each other and now dealing with the Japanese. So for years, you're seeing hundreds of thousands of people who are fighting, dying, being displaced, suffering from famine. Um, and this is one of the most important theaters for Japan. If not, well, it is the most important. There we go. I'm going to say it. And it's because of this war in China that the rest of the Pacific War matters. It's, it's trying to get the resources and um, control to end this war in China that Japan even feels necessary uh, to invade Southeast Asia, to invade the Pacific, and of course it's the Western powers uh, opposing this war in China that makes this a, an issue. Right, but, because they were expanding to uh, go after oil and uh, rubber reserves, if I remember correctly. Is that right? Yes, because uh, um, Western uh, embargoes on those resources are making it more difficult to continue the war in China. They had thought, erroneously, that they could capture the capital, um, which they did, obviously, and which was accompanied by a horrific massacre and one of the worst crimes of the Second World War. Uh, but the Chinese didn't stop fighting. So they're stuck in this quagmire on the mainland and running out of options. And that's one of the reasons why the militarists, the, the people in power who have these crazy ideas, were able to, to push the way they did to attack, you know, everyone. But from a, uh, a battlefield space, from looking at this as something that is crucial to how the war developed and how people should be understanding the war, we just don't see this being explored in popular media very much. And I think that's a shame because there are a lot of people who gave their everything for, you know, keeping China free or, you know, trying to keep China free during this war. And it, it gets completely ignored. So that's why I think we should talk about it. Yeah, and we were mentioning this a little bit before we started recording today, but the only real mentions of China during the Second Sino-Japanese War come from, it's like the last 10 minutes of the Michael Bay movie Pearl Harbor where they get shot down in in China and have to bail out. And it's about the Americans fighting the Japanese in China for about five minutes. And then... Apparently, I didn't see I didn't see this movie, but apparently this also happens in Midway, the uh, movie that came out last year. Is that one also by Michael Bay? I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't be, think so. <laughs> it'd be pretty funny if it was two Michael Bay movies talking about yep. the only mention that Westerners get of 
the Sino-Japanese War, the second one. Yeah. Um, in, in film, it's tricky because, yeah. uh, especially with Hollywood film, you have to appeal to, you know, a Western audience and, and that, well, for the most part, appeal to Western audience, but now we're increasingly seeing appeals to different types of markets, right? So if you look at Midway, for right. example, uh, there actually was quite an extended scene about the Doolittle raids and about the impact that those raids had on China because Japanese reprisals in China after the Doolittle raids were quite extensive and, and horrific. And that I, I interpreted when I saw the film, because I, I did see it, you know, pity me, that, Sorry. <laughs> that this was an appeal to a Chinese market. But yes, for the most part, at least in the past 20 years, you see very few films and even fewer games trying to address you know this huge front of the war and i do think there's a few reasons for that which we can get into of course yeah uh, i was uh we were uh also trying to rack our brains for any games that cover this period and the most mainstream game that comes close would be uh it would be medal of honor uh rising sun back in oh boy i think it was like 2005 maybe um, because you're an American soldier turned OSS agent uh, that ends up doing all these crazy things in the South Pacific. And uh, at one point, you end up in Burma um, fighting the Japanese there with the Chindits. And that's about the closest you get to it. Other than that, um, there aren't really many other AAA titles, uh, anything big mentioning it. And even then, I mean, Bur- Burma isn't China by any means, but that's the closest you can get. Yeah, and that's that's interesting because that that plays into how the Western historiography, how the the you know pop culture image of the war in Asia uh, came down to us, right? And that is because the British fighting in Burma and from the American context, uh, General Stilwell in Burma was the lens through which we got access to what was happening in China. So everything that was, you know, the, the China theater being this tertiary theater for the western powers was being filtered to western pop culture in the 40s and 50s through burma which is fascinating in its own right (laughs) but that also leads to why i think we have some of these issues with the theater as a whole or with china as a place to set pop culture is because it's being filtered through this very american lens through stillwell or through the british lens through the chindits and, and british imperial context that we're not seeing the Chinese point of view. And because of the wiles of history, after the war ended and the Chinese Civil War happened, you're not going to see that for a long time. You're not going to see a lot of talking about what happened during the War of Resistance or the Second Sino-Japanese War from China because it's such a, a point of contention for the nationalists on Taiwan and the CCP that came to dominate the mainland, right? Yeah, that's a whole can of worms because neither of them really wants to talk about, oh, hey, the other one still exists. And they also fought the Japanese because they don't want to give any uh, legitimacy to the other, other government. I think, you know, in Taiwan, they're still like, yeah, we we should own China. I don't, I, don't, I think they're less... Uh, yeah, they've dropped off on that for a while. But... Yeah, they're less rabid about it than the CCP, who I think if everyone turned around for a minute, like if China pointed, like, hey, what's that over there? And everyone looked, they would just grab Taiwan immediately. <laughs> it's definitely an issue for Taiwan's defense. Yeah, yeah, so Taiwan is like, hey, don't don't look away from here, please. <laughs> <laughs> don't let China gotcha. Mm-hmm. But the the, the second, the, excuse me, not the second, the uh, Chinese Civil War in um, in and around the greater scheme of World War II, because they were fighting each other before the Japanese really did anything to them, if I'm correct in that. Yes. They the, were, in, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, the, 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 um, the nationalists were sending out campaigns to try and eradicate the communists throughout the 30s. And they were winning, if I remember correctly. They were almost taking over uh, most of the country at that point. I remember there were other individual warlords, but the nationalists were uh, beating the hell out of the communists, if I remember right. Yeah, the Northern Expedition secured a lot of territory for the nationalists, and then their punitive expeditions against the communists, uh, there was five or six of them. I'm sorry, I don't have anything open in front of me, but they were largely successful, right? It was basically just Mao Zedong in the south who held out throughout the early 30s, and then he had to do his long march where they had to retreat 
to the west and the north of the country to try and escape and, and find some place to settle down. And that's where they ended up before the war broke out proper, right? And everyone got distracted. So you can even see some historians uh, saying, well, the Japanese secured the survivability of the CCP because it allowed the, uh, or forced the nationalists to turn their attention to the much more pressing threat. And, you know, the, the nationalists did want to keep pushing to eradicate the communists. That was something that was uh, near and dear, but um, it gets complicated, but they were uh, forced to reorient towards an anti-Japanese policy. Yeah, and that's a complicated topic. I don't think we can go too into yeah. today because, I mean, the the Chinese Civil War uh, is just a whole... It's like three different cans of worms all at once. And none of which are but... in wargaming. So. <laughs> <laughs> also not in wargaming. Well, a little bit, but we'll get into that in a minute. But there's not really anything major covering it other than a few smaller things here or there. Mm-hmm. Um, it is interesting, though, just noting that China is a huge country, and it's not something we really think about in the West much in general. Um, but in in terms of wargaming specifically, because it's so bizarre that China is about the size of the continental United States. It's it's huge, but it's it's a big country, and we don't see any action in there from our perspective at all. And I I pulled up some numbers a while ago, and it's like fifteen to twenty million Chinese died in the war, and it's it's like just not registered at all um it's not something we get from a at least an american perspective i don't know how it is for you uh you canadians if you get any more good chinese content than us but i doubt it no we don't really talk about the second Sino japanese war in public education but yeah, well, it, it isn't no does. yeah well i mean now they do but that's something we can talk about with uh, how they they have changed this image of the war in mainland china you know from 20 years ago to even 10 years ago to right now. And it, it, the idea of what this war means for China keeps shifting and it, it's very political in nature. But I oh, think, yeah. You know, if we were to go looking at what games even touch on this at all, um, mm-hmm. so we have, you know, there are some shooters like Call of Duties and uh, Medal of Honors that are based in the Pacific. And from an American point of view, and you're focusing on the war that way uh always american too it's not you don't see uh british troops or uh the dutch merchantmen or anything like that uh and it's always the marines you never see it from an army perspective which is interesting yeah that's actually interesting i I suppose the marines were generally first in right but the army actually played a lot of important roles in the different island battles when they arrived but i think that's just um you know we're we're talking about gaming here we got to talk about marketability you got to talk about Right. Um, product and it's evident that having an american focus for your war games especially second world war games just sells better and that's something that's just always going to be difficult when we're talking about why don't we look at x other theater or x other conflict to for war gaming or why don't we you know have this as part of our pop culture and that's just sales have to be made um There was a a board game recently came out called Undaunted Normandy. And I remember there being some, you know, tiny flack for that uh, game. It's a good game, by the way. But saying, why do we have another game set in Normandy? Why another game set uh, in D-Day with Americans and Germans, right? That's boring. Uh, And the designer came out and said, well, I needed to sell this one because I want to do other games in other theaters, but I needed to prove that this would sell first. And the way you do that is by making it American and making it sell uh, um, set in, in Normandy. So if you look at most even physical war games coming out, like board war games, there's an overwhelming number of World War II than not World War II. And of that, you're going to have a lot dealing with the the big names, right? Normandy, Battle of the Bulge, um, and then to a lesser extent, you have stuff on the east like Stalingrad. But hitting that market is what's really important for people. So when you see Call of Duties and uh, Medal of Honors, you're going to have American protagonists and they're going to deal with American topics because that's what's going to sell. Right. And I remember Undaunted actually, after the Normandy game, they came out and they did a, a second game in North Africa with the, uh, the British uh, long range recon patrols, mm-hmm. the uh, precursors of the SAS against uh, the Italians. Actually, it wasn't even Germans. It was the Italians, which yeah. I thought was really interesting because no one, 
it, it, the Italians are not quite as overlooked as the Chinese theater, but the, the Italians are pretty dang overlooked in uh, World War II. No one, no one talks about the Italians. Yeah, I think it, it's telling that um, the designer had to, or felt it would be better to do a Normandy game first, and then as a sequel, now that he already gained some clout, say this is a good design, people like this design, now I can look at other theaters. So it's important. Although I do want to note that he also, if you read the rule book for Normandy, he is following his grandfather's unit. So that adds a, a personal dimension. I'm not saying he's entirely like sure. you know, chasing the money, but it, you have to be <laughs> realistic, right? You have to be realistic, and especially if you're in a niche of a niche, which is board war, war games, right? Yeah, I mean, it, it's the same thing in sales everywhere. That's why we're seeing so many reboots and movies and everything right now. Um, they're rebooting all these various movies. We're getting... They're, they're rebooting Fresh Prince of Bel-Air now. It's something I heard about the other day. <laughs> and I don't see any reason for that to exist. Um, but it does because it's been proven that it can sell. And the same the same thing that exists in movies and TV exists in... It exists in games too. Like Normandy sells. It's been proven that it sells. And everyone's tired of it. But everyone will also still go play it, so it's kind of like a catch twenty two because no one wants to go make anything outside of it because it hasn't been proven that it makes money. Um, the some exceptions are, you know, you get yeah, you know, like you mentioned, you get your Stalingrads, um, you get you know, some Pacific games, but not too many recently. Um, but really, the only major things that we've seen are going to be games that aren't necessarily focused on the second Sino-Japanese War, but we'll include it. Um, and we actually have a list of a few games here that do have scenarios or some amount of focus on the second Sino-Japanese War. Um, none of them, it's not the main focus for any of these, but they they do have uh, some unique aspects here. So the, the first one that uh, we have is the Order of Battle World War II, um, it's a Morning Sun DLC for the game, which is from the Japanese perspective, looking at the Marco Polo Bridge incident, um, leading into a later uh, gamified fake assault on uh, some other Chinese cities. I don't remember which one's off the top of my head, but... Yeah, it ends with the assault on the capital chunking, like the, the wartime capital where Chiang Kai-shek was hiding. Like, if you... If you play the game to the end, you can capture Chiang Kai-shek as the Japanese. Jeez. Yeah, but it's, um, that's like one of the biggest, you know, biggest games dealing with the war. And that is already fairly indie, right? Like, um, Order Battle is put through Slytherin Matrix and they do a lot of, um, niche war games and they're, they're a smaller company, right? And that is by far the, like the biggest name attached to a war game dealing with this war and they've, they've been pretty um prolific with looking at underrepresented campaigns in that game so i'm happy to see that they actually took the time to look at you know the chinese war even though they did it from the japanese point of view because they had a campaign previous to this where you could do the pacific wars from the japanese point of view um but then order of battle has gone and done other things like they've done the um the winter war between finland and russia yeah, and, that's another topic that isn't talked about very much. Yeah, so I'm happy to see the Order Battles taking the time to do it. And for the most part, I mean, it's they they gamify it a bit because if you're not familiar with Order of Battle, it's following the Panzer General style of game where you have a hexagon grid and you have units um, that are you know traditionally one vehicle or one unit with a, a, a HP bar of between one and ten that represents the number of troops and number of vehicles in the unit, and it's very um, a puzzly kind of war game. But one of the things you can do with that is stick a lot of um, interesting and uh, ve interesting vehicles. So you have all like the the experimental tanks or the tanks that were sent to China but never got a chance to actually see service, and a lot of strange Japanese tanks floating around in that game. And that's one of the uh, you know appeals for people if you look online is that it has you know this underrepresented stuff, but it's not really a proper like it doesn't go into it right you you have the different battles and it'll mention some events that happen at the same time like uh, in in the first scenario it'll tell you oh here is the part where the chinese units that were working with the japanese rebelled and massacred this village and now they're working with the chinese side so like it'll mention these things in little pop-ups but you're getting a um 
fictionalized version of the war and one that is stuck conforming to a Panzer General style of game. So if you're not okay with, you know, moving these individual units around a hexagon board and restarting when you never get caught out by something the game throws at you, then you're not really going to enjoy yourself. I mean, I like that game. I like the, 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 the puzzle aspect of it, but it's, it's a very stilted representation of the war. I hate to yeah, say. Uh, with, with those kinds of games, um, the Panzer General games, because they're geared towards you just making big gains, I would say. You have to... There, there's a suspension of disbelief there um, to, to make it fun, because... Uh, there, you you want games that are authentic. You want games that are realistic, but realistic doesn't always translate to being fun. And I can say for a lot of people who you know, want to play these games is that they don't want to do a hyper realistic. You know, I'm going to manage all of the logistics for all of these troops. Well, people play Gary Giggs, Gary Grigsby's games, so there are some people who want to do this. But a lot of people for the more mainstream war gaming audience aren't super into um the actual reality of it because they want to take the game they want to take the scenario and play it to in a way that would make it fun yeah that's that's perfectly reasonable i i understand that it's just i suppose i i would wish there would be a um a middle ground between capturing chiang kai second and and taking chongqing and managing every division and that's just but like i understand that the realism and that avoidance of realism also helps because this is an atrocious war right and you don't want a lot of people when they're playing games don't want to be in control of these you know massacre carrying out units whose every second option was okay we have to go through and massacre these villages because um someone sabotaged our our depot a couple times like the the japanese war in china was horrendous oh yeah it's it puts a lot of what's happening elsewhere in the second world war to shame so i can see yeah. that you want to pull that back a little bit to not you know have to engage with that but then again we're gamifying war here right and this happened yeah it, it was an extremely dirty war i mean there there was there's a one of the most famous events that happened in the japanese occupation of china during the time is called the rape of nanking and it's not called that for no reason it's and this is not like an isolated incident like these things happened but if i'm if i'm like sitting down on a weeknight and i'm thinking okay i want to go play uh go play a war game in my spare time have some have some fun i don't want to be in charge of the troops that are doing that and know that they're doing that in the war game because <laughs> that would just suck i would feel i would feel bad i mean yeah it, it some people might not mind or some people might like the realistic aspect of it but it, it's the same reason that um games showing the germans during world war ii just don't cover the holocaust or anything like that at all or their treatment of the eastern europeans as they moved in because you're not you can't identify and play with them if that's the case um yeah. or at least if you're you know not a far right guy who plays some of these <laughs> games for the for the Live, living vicariously through the Nazis part, in which case, um, please stop listening to this podcast if that's you. See, that takes us beautifully into the next game on the list, Hearts of Iron 4. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A game that also doesn't model any of the uh, the war crimes, which would be, you know, I understand, because yeah. it's, it's a hard thing to think about. But that's a big, big thing in the theater. Um, but talking about Hearts of Iron Four specifically, when in terms of the Second Sino-Japanese War, is uh, the Waking of the Tiger DLC, which I think was the third big uh, expansion for yeah. Hearts of Iron Four, um, which really fleshed out China. Before this, China was super, super bland. Um, no, nothing really interesting was there. I think the nationalists and the China and the uh, communist Chinese both had their own their own factions during this time and they uh, both had their own focus trees which is uh if you don't play hearts of iron 4 basically when you load into the game you can pick uh, areas for your government to focus on in addition to researching new jets guns whatever um to say like oh i want the government to focus on this and maybe i'll open up some new building slots or it will give me a reason to go to war with x other country or what have you and it was fine I didn't really play the Chinese too much 
uh, before this period of time. I think I might have glanced at their focus trees and looked at the Japanese and said, that looks kind of boring. I'm not going to touch it. Um, but the Waking the Tiger DLC uh, really fleshed out China, and it gave all of the various Chinese uh, warlords um, their own focus trees with very hyper-specific Chinese things, like if you do X thing, you can painlessly annex this other uh, warlord and uh, take them under your control. And there's a lot of uh, things here that simulate the kind of phony war that was going on between the Chinese and the Japanese between between the uh, period of, I think it was 1931 is when all this really kicked off, and 1937 when the Marco Polo Bridge incident happened because the, the Japanese would try to incite something small and then you know, there will be a little bit of a, a scuffle at the border, but nothing big. Um, and, and, the, and this game simulates that, and I don't think anything else does. So, you know, the props to Hearts of Iron 4 for really um, giving these small skirmishes their their time in the sun. Yeah, it was interesting for me when I got a hold of this DLC. I was interested to see what they were trying to do with it, and that they actually did take some time to, you know, you can play the CCP, the, the communists, as they acted during the war, right? You can kind of hang back normally participate and build up your strength and try and let the nationalists bleed themselves dry and i thought okay that's neat that they're they're letting you do this um because that kind of runs contrary to a lot of what modern mainland china's narrative is of the ccp's actions during the war but also the fact that it, it, they give you like they they flesh out the um manchuria manchukuo the the puppet state and you can try and and you know, break free and take it back as a, the last Qing emperor, right? Like they, they, they put some effort into it. So I appreciate that, even if it's a bit wacky, but that's Hearts of Iron and not sure right? I get the game. It's a bit wacky. Yeah. But, the A, uh, the A historical options are, in my opinion, one of the most interesting parts of Hearts of Iron 4. Uh, but I'm someone who played a lot of it at launch. And so th a lot of the game at launch was just, here's what happened historically. Play it out. Yeah. See if you can um, hold off the allies as Germany or, I don't know, play the Americans and beat up the Germans like you always do. And that was fine for a time. But the ahistorical options, are, I think, are really what differentiates Hearts of Iron 4 from a lot of its contemporaries. Not that there are many other games that do what it does. Hmm. Um, but, you know, sometimes I do want to be the last Qing Emperor and uh, <laughs> take over China. Or maybe I do want to play a democratic Japan and not take over China and instead fight with... The Chinese against the encroaching communist hordes of the USSR, or what have you. I, I think that that um, is some of the more interesting parts of the game. Yeah, and I did, a historic it might be though. <laughs> no, no, I, I commend it that they did the research into you know here were these attempted coups in Japan that might have led them a different direction, or here is uh, the different states that Chiang Kai Shek tried to deal with, and what happens if he did get support from these other states. Like I, I appreciate that they take the time to do that. So you're going to see at Hearts of Iron one of the more fleshed out versions of the war. And I think that's part of my point is that, you know, Hearts of Iron is where you see the most fleshed out <laughs> approach, uh, approaching this war. <laughs> and that is good for them, but it signals the um, tertiary nature, I suppose, of this conflict in most people's minds, right? Because you're this is the biggest, this is by far the biggest name game that deals with it. Oh, and definitely. I, I appreciate that they do. I suppose if you're looking beyond Hearts of Iron into the more grognardy war games, there are a few of them. Yeah, sorry, uh, grognardy. It's war games for those who are very into the minutia of the detail of war games. Uh, it, grognard it, is French for grumbler. <laughs> yeah, Napoleon's own, right? Yeah. <laughs> but some of those games do tackle the second snow japanese war like uh operational art of war 4 that has several scenarios dealing with the uh the the mainland war um strategic command has the war in it uh it's world war 2 games have that but yeah can you think of anything else uh those two were the only other games that were built to focus on this at all i think well they not even really focus on it operational art of war 4 i don't even remember if the devs built any scenarios for the sino-japanese war at all there was one because in launch. okay yeah well because what i can say is that i know that they made some dlc ones 
but the 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 really nice parts of operation operational art of war for shine in a lot of community built mods and i there there are probably some uh scenarios revolving around the war that exist out there but the game doesn't really focus on the war as a whole it focuses more on operational level things so you can i mean it's in the name it's operational art of war for um so you you might hear about specific operations but you know it's it's a game marketed to westerners and i i personally couldn't tell you any operation any specific operation that occurred during this war other than like the initial push uh right around the time of the marco polo uh, bridge incident other than oh yeah there was a lot of fighting there like I, i'm not i don't <laughs> i don't want to claim to be a uh, an expert on this myself just because there is such a lack of content in the area at the time yeah the some games that specifically try and focus on one part of this war you generally see the uh, ichigo offensive that was in 1944 japan tried to push as hard as they could trying to end uh if not end the war in china but then to make such gains that it would be um impractical they thought to try and fight them out of it and they would the allies would go for like a negotiated peace and that was huge and it was this massive run from beijing all the way down to the south of china where they tried to overrun american air bases they tried to uh connect over land their uh southeast asian holdings and that is where you see especially in board war games it's usually operation ichigo that is focused on because it is this like big mobile war where the the japanese are pushing everything into it. it's one of the largest offensives of the war and if you look at some some historians talking about it they put it on the same level as like kursk or you know like the, these are the these big operations that defined how the war went ichigo was huge yeah and you know this is something i didn't really know about you know, it, I have learned something today, and that's great. Um, <laughs> but you mentioned something here, and I, I think that this is interesting as well, is that, uh, you know, the, the American air bases in China during the time, like, there were American troops in China. I mean, not really any fighting on the ground, yeah. um, as far as I know, unless there's some things that are still classified here almost 100 <laughs> years later, which there could be. There are things that are classified, you know, 50, 75, 100 years, or just permanently. Um, so it, it's possible that there could be. Probably not, though. Um, but the Flying Tigers were a, uh, a thing. The, the Flying Tigers were an American unit of uh, pilots uh, that volunteered to go over and uh, fight for the Chinese against the Japanese during World War II. I think that they might have actually started going over before the Americans officially entered the war. Yeah, they were, they were serving under... Chiang Kai-shek, like they were part of the Chinese Air Force at the time. Before the nationalist Chinese, specifically. Yeah. Like, Chiang Kai-shek personally paid them, um, uh, clearly Chanel and his his guys. And then when America joined the war, they got reintegrated back into the American forces. And of course, that led to some issues with what their missions are going to be from that point onwards, right? Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting thing. Um, there is a you game know, Sorry, there was a a flight sim game, a really? arcade one. It's just called Flying Tigers. Oh, uh, well, there's something. See, see, there's a game for everything. Well, <laughs> not really, but yeah, it's good that they got some attention. I think if I remember right, it might have been IL Two or another flight simmy game that had a little bit on them, but not hmm. too much. Um, I may be mis misremembering this, but I think that there was something there at the time. Maybe it was one of the uh, Microsoft combat flight simulators that existed. I think it was like the late nineties. Um, that, that'd be really interesting because that's something even, I don't know many games besides that one flying tigers game, but you have um, Soviet airmen who were fighting for the nationalists at the same time. You, know, you have Chinese uh, pilots who are um, learning from the Americans learning from the, uh, the Soviets and they're up and fighting. And a lot of Japan's expertise in the Pacific came from learning fighting in the air war over China. So that's that's a really fascinating topic, and we need to have more games talked about it. Uh, I'm just doing a quick Wikipedia on it because it's been probably at least 15 years since I played it. Um, and uh, it looks like it's it says, American and Japanese perspectives about the Pacific War 
um pacific war is a very very broad term and could maybe include china i I can't say whether it does or not in this case um and i certainly don't have a copy of the game lying around anywhere right now because it's been so long i my my computer doesn't even have any disk drives i couldn't even play it if i wanted to right now i would have to go find a cracked copy of it somewhere which i don't want to endorse on this podcast so how about this if you're a flight sim expert let us know which games cover the second Sino japanese war or at least cover the flying tigers yeah uh go ahead dm me i'll we'll plug our twitters at the end here but <laughs> dm me and we'll mention you uh mention you next time uh with any kind of flying tigers-esque game that would be appreciated but to circle back to what we were saying here we also mentioned strategic command which is um more of a broad grand strategy war game kind of i don't know if grand strategy is the right word grand war game i think might be the closest thing you can get to it because uh in that one i don't think it focuses on the second sino-japanese war either um it's kind of like hearts of iron 4 where it's just another theater of war because you control all of the allied forces or all of the axis forces in an area Mm -hmm. um i'm i've played a lot of the world war one version of this game i haven't really touch the world war ii version but i know you can like say oh i'll play as in world war one for example i'll play as germany and i'll let the ai control the ottomans and the austrians or you can just control all of them so i would i would uh, assume that you could control you know the communist uh, chinese and the nationalist chinese at the same time in this but there isn't a huge amount of flavor in these games it's kind of you, you move around uh unit tiles from hex to hex and uh you you attack the other guy there's not a huge amount to it other than um equipping your units it's more logistical focused i would say but it's not really going to go deep into what's going on in that theater other than there's some people fighting the japanese it's got kind of more of an axis and allies vibe right yeah i think that's a that's a good way to put it um it's not really it doesn't follow the history of it to a a very large extent it just puts you at the start date and says okay go get them so it's not going to follow any offensives or anything like that which is you know fine for a game of this scale but something like hearts of iron 4 kind of makes you follow the history more or go directly against it but it shows you what happened and it kind of takes your hand and pulls you in that direction whereas this game you can just say ah i think i'm just going to invade uh russia as china in this direction or whatever (laughs) it's something that doesn't make any sense and there's nothing really stopping you from doing it it's just part of the game Mm. so it it shows the theater i don't think it's probably the best example of this but it does show it so uh you know good for you (laughs) yeah this is like one of our problem when we started talking about this right there's there's not much and i think that's an issue that needs to be addressed right yeah that's it's the whole reason we thought of this topic in the first place is because oh yeah let's talk about this thing that's interesting and talk about all the war games that cover it there's like four yeah i mean i wrote in one of my first articles for wargamer like two years ago was looking at games that had scenarios that dealt with this war and looking back at that now i don't think we've seen pretty much anything come out since then that would have changed my list you know from 2017 or whatever yeah, I think on that list, the only other thing that we haven't mentioned, um, there was a mod for Company of Heroes 1 that I didn't play that you uh, found. It's called the Far Eastern mod for Company of Heroes. Mm. Yeah, and that, that one adds um, several Chinese factions and, and Japanese factions to the basic Company of Heroes you know, skirmish format. I, I don't think there was a campaign when I played it. It was just introducing those those factions. But I mean, they put some work into it. But uh, it's it just plays like company of heroes of course but there is a, a lot of focus and attention on you know gamifying how a nationalist unit works or a communist unit works they have like the different focuses on um you know more infantry focused and uh, sure a little more stealthy approaches to things right so it's, it's more gamified but that's the company of heroes way but i think that points us that or in the direction that we have to look at modders or indie game people to see any of this come out because there's just not enough in it for large companies to do a game set in the second Sino Japanese war, especially as we head more towards uh, a game industry that has to take into account Chinese markets and therefore 
Chinese perceptions, especially state perceptions about how these things happened, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, you can see it probably easiest in the uh, in the movie industry because, you know, there was a lot of talk of I think it was the Marvel movies that really like created this thing. Like um, there were people saying things like, oh, we want to see like a gay character in uh, I don't know, the Marvel movies. We want Iron Man or whoever to be gay. I don't remember who they, they were talking about for this. It's been so long since I've seen a Marvel movie, but they held off on it for so long because they wanted the Chinese money. And uh, the Chinese government is very anti um, anything LGBT. Uh, thanks, CCP. Um, and so, you know, they, they, they held off on that because China is like a, a multi-billion dollar movie market. And the same thing exists for the game industry because recently we've seen a lot of really big um, successes in China with video games. Uh, things like, you know, I mean, a lot of mobile games, um, Fortnite specifically, I know is pretty big. Um, but the uh, there is kind of a precedent also for uh, war games in China. Specifically, last year we saw uh, Total War Three Kingdoms comes out, which covers the romance of the Three Kingdoms period in China, uh, which is another civil war in China, funnily enough, but just very very long ago i think it was about 200 ad um and i like that game very much it's very good and i can tell you that uh it sold super well in china i don't remember how many copies it sold right away but i remember that the chinese accounted for i think it was either about half or over half of the copies sold within the first few weeks and there's not many western games that aren't triple a that really appeal to a chinese audience so it was interesting to see that you know, kind of a more niche genre, a uh, war game strategy game. I don't know what you would quantify uh, Total War as specifically, but they they really uh, knocked it out of the park with that one, getting um, the Chinese audience to buy into their game. So what you have to consider here is, as, as you mentioned a, a few minutes ago, Joe, that uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese people do have a very specific perception of the Second Sino-Japanese War. And if you want to sell a game to them, uh, it's going to have to be something that both meets the government's standards and also meets the people's perceptions of what the war is. And to portray it accurately, well, I don't, I don't know if I would consider the Chinese government's perception of the war to be accurate by any means. See, I think the one of the biggest issues, if I was a AAA studio and I, I wanted to make a game about the Second Sino Japanese War, is that it's inconsistent like it changes uh every few years depending on what politically is going on right so if you look like <laughs> during mao's time or or uh, deng xiaoping's time you just didn't talk about it because that was not something that was prudent to bring up but you know 15 years ago 10 years ago um it became politically expedient to start talking more about the second Sino japanese war in terms of modern day politics right so every time um something big is going on not every time often when something big is going on in southeast asia or east asia sorry east asia being china korea japan yeah, east yeah. and southeast asia they're kind of they're kind of meddling in the whole area right now yeah uh you see them bring up you know japanese war crimes during the second Sino japanese war uh that comes up um pretty common but also what's been changing is the uh acceptance of nationalist china as a fighting force in the second Sino Japanese war. Cause we, we know now obviously that they did all the fighting. <laughs> 90% of the fighting was carried out by nationalists and, uh, warlord allies. The CCP specifically, uh, by their own admission, didn't fight super hard during the war because that wasn't what worked for them. Right. Their strategy was to, um, offer assistance to the nationalists and then, make sure they were the ones going in to get people on their side to help people who were being uh, harassed and, and attacked by the Japanese, right? So they were running around behind the lines and bothering the Japanese and then trying to help people and get them on their side, while the nationalists were the ones who were on the front lines um, suffering the horrendous casualties. So it meant yeah. after the, the war, during the Civil War, they had a much more um, solid base. They had a better position than they had before the war started 
Oh, definitely. I know that the nationalists weren't very popular during their uh, time fighting the Japanese um, and the, the, the communist Chinese. I mean, you can say what you will about the Chinese, the, the uh, communist Chinese party at the time. Um, and as I am certainly no fan of them myself, but the nationalists weren't um, weren't a uh, modern rendition of Lube by any means. They were uh, I, I, I don't know if this is uh, an anachronism, but I remember hearing stories about uh, Chinese nationalist soldiers being led to the front in chains because there was no other way to get them up there. Like they were a chain gang, but they were a soldier. <laughs> they were a chain gang of soldiers going to the front to the fight the Japanese or it was the communist Chinese because they just didn't want to fight. They had to force them to. So I haven't heard of that specifically, but yeah, the, um, it might be an exaggeration, but that is what I heard. The recruitment was difficult for the nationalists because they, they had their, their best forces were spent pretty immediately, um, fighting the Japanese in Shanghai and around Nanking. And then it was just a matter of, um, recruitment and impressment of whoever you could to go into the, to fight at the front lines. And that meant pulling people away from farming or other industries. So it was really, um, it wasn't a life anyone wanted, right? No one, no one at the time wanted to be drafted by the, uh, the national army because it was not a nice way to live. And that's just part of uh, the deep discussion of warlord armies and nationalist armies um, in China in that period, right? It was not, the 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 place you wanted to be spending your time what yeah. the pcp did specifically was try and create an army that gave equally back to the non-military parts of surviving this war so soldiers had to also farm and also had to give um time to production so uh, i mean in certain areas you had units where one guy would be on the front and the other two would be taking care of his farmland. And then when his shift was up, he would go back. You know, another guy would go out and the other two would take care of their farmland, right? So everyone was participating in every aspect of resistance. So, it, it, you know, at the time, I bet it would have been nicer to have been a CCP soldier than to be a nationalist soldier. But that's not to say anything is particularly good, right? It's not a happy time anyways. It's probably not a happy time to be involved in a major civil war while you're also fighting against an external power that really doesn't care about anyone's lives where you're living yes it's um, atrocious <laughs> I, i'm not speaking from personal experience i hope uh yet in any case um but you know it's not 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 a great time i would say for uh the chinese people in general mm -hmm. um but that means the the issue now is that when it comes up in the modern context is the the ccp will try and give a little bit more um of the share to their own soldiers than to the national soldiers and this goes back and forth like now they're more okay with saying yeah they did about 50 50 which of course is still egregious but the fact is if you're say you're activision and you want to do another call of duty in world war ii and you want to have some missions in the second Sino japanese war you're going to have to do it with communist um, fighters because to not do it would be to needlessly endanger your game's viability in the region, right? Like, you don't even have to... Like, they, they can accept, and they do accept, that oh, the Nationalists fought, and they, they pulled their weight. But if any of this changes for any reason whatsoever, then boom, your game's out the China market. And the Activision has tried very hard to get into the China market, right? There was 2015 that had um, Call of Duty Online. Uh, if, you, if you want to go look that up, that's really fun, because there's a, a trailer with Captain America... What's Call of Duty Online? Yeah, I yeah. haven't even heard of this. Oh yeah, they tried launching. It's a like um it's like an MMO. style MMO online shooter. Yeah, there's a, a Chris Evans is the name of the actor, right? It's him yeah. and a bunch of Chinese office workers like fighting zombies and stuff. So, what? I mean, oh yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard of this. But what I mean is that's they spent billions getting this on studio, that trailer. Not on the trailer. <laughs> on getting the studio set up in Shanghai, on getting the game developed, getting um, you know, entrenched in the China market to then sell Activision games because you have to have studios on the ground in China to sell games in China or you have right. to be linked to a studio, right? That's why Tencent has their pockets everywhere and then games are coming out in China. So, I mean, to think of a, a studio like a Call of Duty game coming out saying, I want to do this war, you're just 
making life difficult for yourself especially when we go and talk what we talked about at the beginning that this just is not a theater that arouses much interest say outside of the chinese market all right so it's a double-edged sword of of triple a studios just shouldn't be touching this with a 10-foot pole if they value their finances <laughs> yeah and i mean well that's where all the money is you game designers have to have a budget in order to go make something uh, in the area and so there just isn't a lot of western interest there and it's a dangerous field in the first place so uh you know your your uh game designer at activision can say oh yeah i want to go make a, a game in uh set in china for a new call of duty set in china and i the investors would just say no and that would be it <laughs> because it's just it's just from a sales perspective it's very risky um and I mean, these things are all driven by profit. I have no love for Activision myself, but I don't think that they would take that risk in any case. Mm -hmm. So like, then the other point is to, why isn't this a bigger issue in the West? And, you know, we can say the, the nationalistic point of view that people want to see war games about their own people, right? You want to see if you're American, you want to play as Americans, if you're Canadians. I mean, there was what, one mission in Call of Duty 3? Where you could play as Canadians, but I I think that's right. You you got radio uh, general last last earlier this year, so you should be fine for another like three years or so. <laughs> See, you got to go to the indie games, right? Yeah, yeah. I don't think there's been anything major in like anything. They don't talk about the Canadians. Oh, we can have a nice long talk about Canada's um, involvement in the Second World War on another <laughs> gaming about that. But my point is, um, you know, rehabilitating the second Sino japanese war as an important and crucial part of the second world war could be the way to go here right i mean we've call of duty one and two had extensive eastern front you know soviet union sections right um you have enemy at the gates you have it's it's more popular to talk about the soviet union it's fight against nazi germany and i know we don't have the specter of the soviet union um that can try and correct okay no i can't go that way because we could talk about russia trying to rewrite the history of the second world war right now that's what's actually happening right now they are trying to do it but they're a lot less good at it i would say than the chinese or the japanese are though because the chinese and the japanese are pretty good at kind of keeping themselves distant from this and we can talk more about japan in a second but russia is not very good at it in comparison you should read um uh putin's essay about the start of the war <laughs> that he put out um just this year, oh no a months ago oh no Fast yeah um <laughs> i know that the russians are trying they're they're trying to do historical revisionism in a very interesting way and it seems to be almost twitter led is it, it's like it's like if like trump was like telling them it was their pr guy for how you should do historical revisionism or something because I, i've seen like oh yeah russian embassy in the u.s is like um they're they're downplaying a lot of the nasty nasty things that they've done uh they did during the war uh i, I saw one specifically the one that's coming to mind right now is that they just oh yeah the holodomor didn't happen it's like um <laughs> no i think that did happen putin mm -hmm. that that one did happen putin Slight spoiler for that article, if you go to anyone goes and looks it up, he defends the Russian split of Poland with Germany, saying that they were protecting <laughs> the Poles from the Germans by taking Eastern Poland. Oh, yeah, the, that was the other one, is that I think it might have been a link to that article by Putin, but they were saying, like, yeah, the Russians didn't invade Poland, and it's like, no, they they did. There's people alive who were there. They can tell you that they did. <laughs> yeah, so my, my point was that we've seen a shift towards exploring the eastern front of world war ii as a like valid way for mass media to go like uh company of heroes 2 that is a soviet campaign first and foremost right and they tacked on the uh battle of the bulge stuff afterwards right yeah so, that's right and that i think comes from a you know a bit of a revitalization of the very minuscule historiography we had of the soviet union during the war during the cold war because it was very hard to get proper information in the 60s 70s and 80s of what was happening during the war right and that leads into all those other 
chaotic horrors that we can talk about later, like the clean bear mock myth and all that fun stuff. But oh, now boy. people are more aware of what happened and are more interested in learning about the Soviet side of things during the war. And I don't see why that couldn't happen with China if we, you know, see a bit more of a concentrated effort by those in the know to talk about the reality of the war and struggle. And most importantly for me to distance the war in China from the still well Burma nonsense that still predominates everything. Yeah. Uh, and something that I do want to mention also, because we haven't really touched on this too much is that as potentially, you know, uh, aesthetic a topic this is in China as something that could be uh, very inflammatory to a lot of people, it would be equally, if not more so in Japan where they have this big history of just not wanting to acknowledge any of the bad things that they did during the war at all. Like, it, it's very interesting to look at it from a perspective, of, a contextual perspective, because Germany, I would say, did a really good job of just owning up to like, yeah, we, we're the Nazis, we had all these Nazis, and that sucked, and we're going to teach everyone about how much that sucked, so that way we don't have to go through this again. We're not... We're going to own up to it. And the, the Japanese did not really do that. Um, the, the curriculums that they have are very uh, very neutral on it, I would say, maybe at best, saying like, oh, yeah, there was a war, and we all fought, and then we ended up losing, and that's about it. Mm -hmm. um, and the, it, the atomic bomb happened, I think, and like, that's, that's like the end of it. They don't talk about any of what they did in China. They don't want to acknowledge it. Only recently are they starting to really come out and say, you know, oh, there was involvement there. But I know that a lot of the current government is very pro-Japanese efforts during the war. They're very nationalist. Yeah, the... the It's a big topic. Japanese nationalism, Japanese war memory. Um, you're right. They, they, they focus a lot on the dropping of the atomic bombs as this tragedy and that's what they should be focusing on this tragedy of war and this is what war leads to and that's why it needs to be stopped and we don't have that same level of contrition as you see in other you know former fascist states um and that goes for a lot of them of course but japan probably should have done a lot more to make things right when they had the opportunity because now as we said earlier right the Second Sino Japanese War, and uh, in the Korean case, you know their horrible oppression of Korea and the the comfort women issue during the war and the slavery during the war, um, that keeps coming up again and again and again in modern politics. Oh yeah, I think that Shinzo Abe, the current president or is a prime, prime minister. minister, prime minister of Japan, he he basically was like, oh yeah, the comfort women thing didn't happen. They were all willing volunteers for the Japanese Imperial Army. The comfort women. Um, for those of you listening at home, were basically like slaves for the Japanese army. Uh, real nasty stuff. And, you know, don't advise looking into it if you um, are triggered by any of those things, because it's a it's real bad, as were a lot of the things that the Japanese army did during World War II. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a good look by any means. And they don't no. want to acknowledge that it wasn't a good look. Because they just want to pretend it didn't happen. Yeah, it's it's tragic because you see some individual efforts by people in government to say, you know, to apologize or whatever, but they never you never get the full proper backing of the state uh, doing what Germany did. And that's the, the bar by which most people set this kind of behavior. And because Japan doesn't live up to it, it's a bad look. Um, and there are a lot of nationalist conspiracy theorists in Japan, and there's a, a lot of um, mass media stuff that plays into that that still pushes the same ridiculous crap from, you know, decades ago or even a half century ago where they're blaming all their societal ills on Koreans or they think that the uh, Nanjing massacre was totally blown out of proportion or that the Japanese war crimes are fictitious and, and a Chinese ploy. And it is absurd yeah. that you still see these vans, um, you know, parked on street corners with old Japanese men yelling through microphones about, the atrocities of the rest of the world visiting on Japan when that's just not the reality. Yeah. And that's post-war education. That's um, the 
way that the Japanese government continued to exist in the form that it did after the war ended, and the fact that you have this difficulty separating the national past with the present. Yeah, and the the thing about that is that, you know, we talked a lot about how China views the war, um, and Japan having this view of the war also is a big turnoff for a lot of studios because Japan isn't as big a market as China. Probably in this field, I would say, you know, um, Japan doesn't have a really big strategy gaming community in comparison to somewhere like the U.S. I mean, there's there's notable examples to us in the West. You know, you have your Fire Emblems that are like really big. You have uh, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms uh, game, not Total War Three Kingdoms, although that's also a thing. Both of those are pretty big in Japan. Um, but yeah, the Koei stuff. Yeah, yeah. But that's um. Oh yeah, no Benaga's ambition. I don't want to skip that one either. But <laughs> there's not too much else in the strategy gaming sphere in Japan. But even then, you know, if a studio was like, "I want to make a game about the Second Sino-Japanese War," it's just from from a sales perspective. If you want the game to sell, if you're making if you're making it as a product that you want to get money back from, it it's just like a minefield. I would say like it makes more sense if you wanted to make a game in this field to approach it as like a passion project and not expect it to sell well in that area at all, because it probably won't, it'll probably be super controversial. Um, but yeah, you know, one of the, go ahead. Sorry. The war gaming in Japan, they have a very large traditional war gaming community, right? Like the board war gaming, the grognardy war games. That we <laughs> yeah. About. There's a lot of Japanese those, grognards. Yeah, those are huge. And the thing I thought was so fascinating when I was, living there and looking into this stuff was how disconnected they seem as a like a, a hobby you know hardcore war gamer with the conduct of japan during the war i remember reading an article in a magazine where the author was talking about being a kid in the 80s and getting a hold of some ancient um midway game an american like midway strategy game mm -hmm. And thinking, oh, he's going to be, he's going to do better than the Japanese fleet, and he's going to win this one. And I thought that that has such a, a strange disconnect with your own nation's history, right? Because you don't see too, too many say, um, I don't know, maybe you do, Germans saying, oh, I'm going to be, I'm going to be better uh, Rommel, and I'm going to do this stuff here. But within the, the Grognardi wargaming community, I, I feel like overall you have that separation of why these wars are fought with the gaming of that war right and that you know I, I have a problem with that being a historian because you can't divorce the why from the actual execution of these things right you have to at least acknowledge that you don't have to, i'm not saying if you uh you know paint up a ss division for flames of war or bolt or something that you're a nazi but you need to be aware of what those people did and why that's a thing and why it's important yeah but it's fascinating to me I would love to see some deep exploration of the Japanese uh, hobby wargaming community vis-a-vis -vis nationalism and Japanese uh, wartime conspiracy theories. Yeah. Because I bet there's some overlap. <laughs> Probably. seem to accept that the war happened as historians say it happened, which I think is, is interesting. But those are the ones I spoke to, and, you know, that's... a. Um, a bias I'm, I'm sure because that's a very small sample size oh yeah and you know they probably are probably the, the best educated people about it in japan or the people who studied it specifically because it's something that was suppressed but you know it's it's kind of it reminds me of america in a way because as nationalist as japan is um we are also a very nationalist country and thinking about it from that perspective you don't really want to as an american come to terms with the horrible things that we've done in our past like uh i, I know that there's games that focus on and we're not going to go too far into this because that's in a whole other uh rabbit hole but you know like uh, early uh colonial things like um i think empire total war you can start settling in america and building up the u.s and whatnot and it's kind of it doesn't really show what happened and you don't want to know what happened if you're playing it because it would make you feel terrible and as an american dealing with these things because you know um the japanese have a lot of blood on their hands for world war ii we have a lot of our blood on our hands for other things it's not something that would sell here because we don't want to feel bad when we play a game 
we want to play a game and have fun. It's a form of escapism for a lot of uh, for a lot of folks. And you know that it's it's talking about the um the Japanese guy you were talking about a minute ago who picked up the American copy of that board game. He probably wouldn't be playing it if he had this national conscience of guilt on his mind. It doesn't sell if you're if you feel guilty. So mm. if you want to sell a game in China and Japan, you can't do anything to make anyone feel guilty. But both of them want the other people to feel guilty if they're if the game is being sold. So uh, good luck, I guess, if you're planning on making a game in that theater. Mm. Yeah, and I think that's just part of, you know, issue number 452 <laughs> that we've mentioned today of why this is a difficult thing and why we don't see it. And that isn't to say I don't think we shouldn't see it because I would love to see more of these things. And I do want to just go on record and be like, we're not tarring every single Japanese person with a brush of nationalism, oh, no. nor tarring every Chinese person as a uh, follower of the CCP, because of course we've, I'm sure everyone has spoken to many people who have a variety of opinions on the state of China and the state of Japan and the state of the United States and Canada. Where it's just individuals are being grouped here for convenience's sake. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is the general perception but individuals don't necessarily add up to the general perception. Like, mm -hmm. uh, certainly, I would say that you and I, and probably a fair amount of people who are going to listen to this, are probably better educated on, um, you know, quote unquote, the sins of our fathers in terms of what we've done and are able to look at these things with the uh, a more historical context. Um, but, you know, as we mentioned, historical context can be tricky to deal with. Yeah. But I mean, I suppose that just gets back to my original point of I, I want to see more games dealing with this because, you know, games are that unique way of engaging with history, right? So if it's done right, uh, this is a wonderful way to get people who have no concept of this conflict or have no understanding of it or never thought to, to suddenly, you know, be able to connect on some level with this massive important part of the second world war yeah and hopefully i i hope to see a dev do try that out i mean they would have to probably contend themselves with the fact that they're not going to see many sales in china or japan but for a niche hobby like war gaming or strategy gaming in general you know um it probably wouldn't see many sales from that area anyway so go ahead and do it i'll buy the game i'll tell you that you'll get at least one sale from me <laughs> i mean to mention um Two, because I went looking around to see what was coming out, if, if anything was coming out that dealt with this. Um, there is a board war game from Tai Bomba called Ichigo, which is about um, the Ichigo offensive. You can play as the Chinese or the Japanese. Oh, nice. And digitally, there's something called uh, Rise of the White Sun coming out by Maestro Cinetic. Uh, I'm not sure what that is, but we can link to it. And I think that that's talking about the... Um, the Nationalist Party in the 20s. And I think it's more of a politicking game. But I'm happy to see that there are still some small devs who are, you know, pursuing this. I think it's interesting that it's happening. And I would love to see, you know, if anyone who's reading this comments wants to point more games at us that are dealing with this, I would love to, to take, an, uh, take a look at them, of course. Yeah, totally. It's an interesting topic. And any anything else there would be huge. Uh, just happy to see more. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that just about does it for us here today. I think we could probably keep talking about this for another hour or so, but um, we can save that for another time. Uh, it is a weeknight, so <laughs> I think we'll, <laughs> think we'll wrap it up here. Uh, thank you for tuning in to uh, catch us here today. Uh, please let, let us know what you thought uh, by leaving us a uh, rating and a review wherever you found us uh, on your local podcatcher. I don't know if people still use that term. I remember people used that term for a while. <laughs> I use it, and uh, people look at me funny, but I like it, so I'm going to keep saying that. Um, <laughs> I won't stop you. Uh, okay. You you can uh, get more of us here. Uh, I'm at, at Jack underscore Trumbull at Twitter, and Joe is at Joe Fonseca Hist, so H-I-S-T, at Twitter.com. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, thank you very much for tuning in tonight. And uh, do you have any last thoughts for our uh, audience here, Joe? No, I thanks for tuning in thanks for listening to us ramble on and you know let us know what you want us to talk about next and we'll take into account 
yeah, be happy to hear from you all. Thank you very much and uh, have a good one.